Welcome, dear friends, to the midweek Bible study at the Westside Church of Christ in Alvin, Texas, for Wednesday, May the 20th, 2020. To all of those out in the audience who are our guests today and watching this video, we are so very glad that you have chosen um, to be with us and uh, certainly hope that the things that you hear today will uh, be beneficial to you in your walk with the Lord. For all of our Westside family, uh, I wanna encourage you to be looking for the Wednesday announcements and prayer list, which you'll be getting uh, by way of email uh, later this afternoon. There are a number of new names on our prayer list who are struggling with their health at this time. And those on our list are doing better, but they all still need our prayers. In the announcement section, there is also some very, very important information for everyone in the congregation. As all of you should know by now, we will be meeting at the building this coming Sunday, May the 24th for morning worship only at 10.30 a.m., our normal worship time. We recognize that there are those who are not yet ready to venture out to worship in public at the building yet, and that is fine. We support you in that, and we will continue to provide the worship service uh, online uh, for everyone. Everyone is asked to please read the plan that we have sent out from the elders. Read that plan carefully as they have laid out um, the things that we will need to do in order to meet together and to do that in the safest way possible. You should have received this plan last evening in an email, but it can also be found at the end of the announcement sheet. Uh, I believe it's on about page three or four of the announcements. So it's there also, if you haven't had a chance to see it in the other email, uh, please, please take a look at it and read it all uh, very carefully. Well, before we continue our study of the resurrection of Jesus, would you please bow with me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before your holy throne through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, Father, we come thanking you so much for the great blessing of your precious Son who gave his life for us, who suffered and died, and then who was raised from the dead through your power and glory so that we can walk in newness of life if we will only surrender ourselves to Christ. Dear God, we, we thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us every day, even when we're dealing with the pandemic as we are right now. Father, we know that you're there. We know that you're causing great things to work together for good for all those who are called according to your purpose. Even now, uh, wonderful things are happening. And Father, we thank you for those things. We thank you for um, people who are being reached online with uh, worship and Bible class that perhaps would have never uh, seen or, or, or been in our worship or, or seen our Bible classes. We thank you for that and for lives that are being changed. Uh, Father, we just uh, ask in a very special way that you be with all of those uh, who are on our prayer list right now. We know there are others that we're probably not aware of. Please be with all of them, Father. Give them strength in their bodies. Be with the doctors and nurses that are taking care of them. Father, bring healing to them. Bring them back home to their families and back into the body of Christ where they can worship with us when the time is right. Dear God, we just uh, pray uh, thanksgiving for all of those who are uh, getting better. And we pray on their behalf also that that will continue, Father. Dear God, we pray for all their families who are ministering to them daily. Father, we, we, we ask that you be with those families that are, are being directly affected by the virus right now, where family members are sick, and in some cases in the hospital. Uh, and also we pray for those families who have lost loved ones uh, during this pandemic. Father, be with us, and uh, we just pray that, that things will continue to get better as they seem to be. Um, that we will be moving forward and in, in towards the goal of eradicating this virus. Lord, just be with us. Uh, be with us, Father, as uh, those of us who are able to will be getting together again for the first time at the building this Sunday. Bless that, Father, and bless all of those who, for many reasons, are not yet ready 
are able to do that. Uh, bless them, Father, as they worship with us from their homes. Lord, be with us now as we continue this study um, from the Gospels of the precious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch over us and take care of us. In Christ Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as we finished part one of our study of the resurrection uh, last week, the women who were at the cross, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph, Salome, and other women um, who were there at the cross when Jesus died, remember they watched, they followed Joseph and Nicodemus as they took the body off the cross, prepared it for burial, and then took it and put the body in Joseph's new tomb and rolled the stone in front of the tomb. We know that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, for sure were there watching them there in that garden where that garden tomb was near the crucifixion site. And they know exactly where Jesus' body has been laid. I mentioned last week that those that would try any way possible to discount the resurrection story. Um, some of them would say, well, when the women go back on the first day of the week, they go to the wrong tomb. They go to another tomb in which the stone is rolled away. And as I said last week, friends, that's just preposterous. These women <laughs> knew where Jesus was laid. And now um, he has been resurrected from the dead and they are arriving at the tomb uh, sometime after daybreak. We don't know exactly how long, um, but they're arriving at the tomb now. Um, they, as you remember, are bringing spices because they just felt like it, there wasn't enough time uh, on the, the Friday afternoon that Jesus died in order to fully prepare his body for burial before the Sabbath began at six o'clock. So they've come and they're wondering, as they're walking and getting closer to the tomb, they're wondering how they will roll away the stone so that they can further prepare the body of Jesus for burial. Now, I said this last week, it's, it's uncertain as to whether the Roman guard who had been terrified and had become like dead men when the angel descended in front of them and rolled the stone away. Hey, we just can't really tell. Was the guard still there unconscious and the ladies just don't see them? Well, more likely, I would think. Um, by the time the women get to the tomb, the men have awoken and they've rushed out of the garden and rushed to the Jewish leaders to tell them what has happened. Uh, again, we can't know for sure, but that's probably uh, what has taken place. Well, as I stressed in our last study, it seems to me to be clear from all four gospel accounts that Jesus has already ascended from the dead and left the tomb by the power of God before the angel descends from heaven and rolls the stone away and then sits on the stone and then the men are terrified and become like dead men. The Roman soldiers, those pagan soldiers were not allowed to see this magnificent triumphal event and not even the disciples not the women, and certainly not the apostles who were hiding at this time, were allowed to see the resurrection itself with their own eyes. And I think what we, I think what we take from this is that this was a very personal thing within the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When Jesus was raised by the power of God, by his spirit from the dead, the three of them are the only witnesses of the resurrection itself. Well, I've entitled our study this evening, What the Women Saw. And that's really what we're going to deal with tonight. We're going to, to look at what those women who arrive at the tomb and see that the stone has been rolled back, what took place there, what they saw, what they were told, and uh, what happened immediately after um, they are there at the tomb. Let's begin reading tonight in Mark chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6 as we begin our study tonight. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. 
We're going to spend a lot of time this evening in, uh, in Mark chapter 16 and Luke chapter 24. So you might want to take a moment and uh, if you have uh, a marker in your Bible, um, if you'd like to mark Luke 24 and then have your Bible open to, to Mark 16 and then it'll be easier for you to go back and forth and I'll, I'll give you time to do that. I won't go back and forth so fast that you, you're not, not able to keep up. But that's, that's something I would suggest. We'll also look at a few passages from Matthew. But for the most part, uh, we'll, we'll be in Mark and Luke, especially about halfway through the lesson. And then we'll also look at an important section in John's Gospel also. Um, so let's read Mark 16, 1 through 6. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. As I shared last week, Mark's account of the resurrection is the most compact uh, of the four gospels by far. So we'll again be turning to the other gospels uh, to give us more information that is important to see the full the full story of the resurrection. But I also have to say that it is not the easiest thing to fully harmonize uh, all of the various events from the four different gospels time-wise or chronologically, but we're going to give it our best try. In saying that, I don't want to suggest that there's any places where they don't agree. They're simply looking at uh the same events from different vantage points. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. We need to remember that the Gospels were not written always in chronological order. Uh, especially we see that in John's Gospel. That's not the important thing. It's the things that Jesus did that are the most important. And in fact, the gospel accounts of the same event don't always contain the same number of individuals in the story. Here's what I mean. When Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus, remember they're on their way from Galilee to Jerusalem for the last time when he will die and to go through Jericho. That's when he meets Zacchaeus. But he also meets a blind man out on the street named Bartimaeus there in Jericho. Luke says... There was one blind man. Matthew says there were two. Luke simply focuses on the one while Matthew includes both. We'll see similar information in regards to the resurrection story. Mark names three of the women who go to the tomb. Matthew names two of the women. John, though, only names Mary Magdalene, while Luke just says the women. All are correct. They simply focus on different information, different things that take place in the same event. I've used this analogy before in, in lessons and in, in sermons, but it's not unlike four witnesses at a car accident who are on four different corners and the accident is taking place there in the intersection. They all see the same accident but from very different perspectives. And so there are things that they see right in front of them that, for instance, someone directly across didn't see. And so it's much like this with the Gospels. They each have a purpose in the information they give for a given event that is part of the overall scope of that Gospel and the audience that they're writing to. And so they're not in conflict. They're simply providing a different perspective of the same event. And that's what we have here when it comes to the resurrection story. So Mark tells us that the women there at the tomb are Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. She's also called Mary the mother of James and Joseph and Salome. 
So they arrive at the tomb after the sun has risen. So Jesus has been risen from the dead for some time now. We don't know how long, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And it's now after daybreak. Matthew indicates to us that the women see the angel who had rolled the stone away. The same angel who was outside of the tomb, who when he originally descended from heaven, sits on top of the, of the stone. There's no indication that he's still sitting on top of the stone. Perhaps he's just standing in front of the entrance to the tomb now. But remember, it's the same angel that caused his, his appearance caused those Roman soldiers to become like dead men. Follow with me in Matthew 28. We're going to begin in verse 1. We read this text last week, and, and we've already talked about what happened to the soldiers. What I want to focus on is what the angel says to the women when they arrive at the tomb. So I'm in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. That's Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Now that has already taken place either before the women make their way towards the tomb or before, at least before they arrive on their way to the tomb. So the angel coming down, the men falling like dead men, that's already taken place. Again, are the men still there? Probably not. Probably they've already left by this time. But the angel, the angel is still there outside the tomb. Um, what we cannot know for sure is whether or not the women understand that he is an angel. Now remember, it's described that when he first comes down that, you know, he is, his, his raiment is, is just bright as, as, as the sun and clearly, clearly, he's an angel. Um, but whether or not they understand that at this point, we, we don't know. What we do know is that he invites the women to go into the tomb. He tells them that Jesus isn't here. He's risen. And he invites them to go and see in the tomb that it is, in fact, empty. Now, stay with me here. I know this can be a little bit hard to follow. And, and, and I'm trying to not make it difficult. And I sometimes do that in trying to explain things. I realize that. But, but let me try to share this to you, um, with you. It is a little bit hard to follow. But before we go into the tomb with the women, we need to note something very important from John's description of this event. That is, of the women arriving at the tomb. So I'm going to ask you now to turn with me. Keep your place there. Uh, actually, we're not going to come back to Matthew, but um, if you want to keep your place in Mark and go with me to John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. John 20, verses 1 and 2. John writes, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Now, notice John just focuses on Mary Magdalene. He has a purpose in that. He's going to tell us about Mary going to tell the apostles that the tomb is empty, but she doesn't know. She hasn't heard that Jesus has been resurrected yet. She doesn't stay there long enough. I think that is the clear implication here. She does not stay there. As soon as the women arrive at the tomb, Mary sees the stone is rolled away. There's no indication in John's gospel that she sees the angel standing there. She simply sees the stone is gone. And I believe that John is telling us that she immediately turns and runs, leaving the other women there in front of the open tomb. And that's exactly what, what uh, John says here. As soon as she saw the stone, there in the end of verse 1, she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. We believe that's John. 
the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Notice, notice again, and this is very important. Mary hasn't heard anything yet about a risen Jesus. She still thinks someone has stolen the body. Somebody has moved it. Okay. Um, so she knows nothing of the resurrection at this point. So assuming that the women remaining are at least Mary, the mother of James and Salome, and perhaps other women, it, there are other things in the scripture that indicate there are other women with them. But at least those two women, we can be certain, based on Mark's gospel, and also we'll see in Luke, that those women now enter the empty tomb, having been directed there by the angel who is outside the tomb. The angel who we'll see has told them, not Mary Magdalene, she's already gone, but has told these women that Jesus has risen. And again, he invites them to go into the empty tomb and see for themselves. So this is where I'm going to ask you to keep both Mark 16 and Luke 24 marked in your Bibles, because we're going to need to go back and forth for the next few moments as we go into the tomb now. And that's what I really want us to think about. We are spectators watching this event and we watch now as these women go into the empty tomb, directed there by that angel, the first angel, who had descended originally on top of the, uh, and rolled the stone away. All right, so we're going to go back to Mark 16. All right, and we're going to start in verse 5. But I want to point out that between verse 4 and 5, because Mary Magdalene and Mark's gospel is still there in verse 4, between those is when Mary Magdalene has left. She's run, John says, to Peter and John to tell them the body is missing. Again, I know I keep emphasizing this, but very, it's very important for us to understand at this point, Mary Magdalene has no concept of a resurrection or that anything has happened other than someone has moved the body. Okay, so we're going to pick up in verse 5 of Mark chapter 16. And entering the tomb, that is the women that remain, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples in Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, here we're going to see another example of two gospel writers, in this case, Mark and Luke, giving us different information. But it's not conflicting information. All right? Mark, as we just read, mentions only one angel. All right? But notice what Luke chapter 24, verses 3 through 7 states. Luke 24, 3 through 7. So if you want to jump... Uh, forward to Luke. All right, this is what Luke writes. But when they, the women who are still there, minus Mary Magdalene, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, the angel outside the tomb has already told them he's not there, but he wants them to see for themselves, and they go in and he's not there. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. This is the message of those angels there in the tomb, the empty tomb. Now, you'll notice Luke calls them, because Luke says there are two, he calls them men. Mark re refers to one, and he calls them a young man. But Luke makes it clear that they are in dazzling apparel. So we can be absolutely certain that these are angels sent from God. Even though the word angel isn't here, they're angels. Apparently, according to Mark, one of them 
is originally sitting on the right side of where Jesus has been laid. Maybe to point out this is where the body was. But then, according to Luke, the two angels, and there are two, stand up, I suppose, next to each other. Now, and, and, and speak to the women. Now, Mark just focuses on the one angel and what he says. Luke wants us to know that both angels spoke to the women. Again, it's not a conflict, just two different perspectives. And remember, we've emphasized since the beginning of, of this study of Mark, Mark often compacts things for brevity's sake. And I think that's what he's doing here. Mark is the shortest gospel. And he, he, makes, he usually describes things, not always. Sometimes he uses more information, but often it's less information because he's giving his hearers the things that they need in order to help their faith. Okay. So what we have here is just the two different perspectives. Both gospel accounts make it clear that the message given to these women who are now inside and seeing with their own eyes that Jesus is not there, the tomb is empty, the message is he is not here because he is risen from the dead. He is risen. Luke 24, 6 through 7 emphasizes the promise that Jesus made while still in Galilee before that last trip to Jerusalem when he would die. A message that wasn't just given to the apostles, if you notice from the text, but also to the bigger group of disciples of whom these women are part of that bigger group they themselves would have heard this promise of Jesus about his resurrection from the dead before they left Galilee to come down to Jerusalem. Notice what Luke says in verses 6 and 7. Now I'm in Luke 24, 6 and 7. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise in each, each piece of information, each fact in this statement has taken place completely, everything, just as Jesus said it would. Both Mark and Matthew include the information from the angels that Jesus will appear to the apostles and disciples in Galilee. And of course we know he will. It won't happen Immediately, but before his ascension back to the Father, John gives us this very detailed account of how Jesus will meet them in Galilee. Well, notice now back in Mark, go back with me to Mark, Mark 16 and verse 7. Notice Mark says, But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. All right, now we're going to stay in Mark for a moment. Now we come again to different endings in the description of this event in the tomb. That is what happens after the angels tell the women what, what has gone on, that Jesus is risen, and what they're to do. Okay, one of these endings is in Mark. We'll read it in a moment. The second is found in both Luke and Matthew, almost verbatim, very, very close. All right, so I want us to read them all, and I'm going to make a, a few comments. So now I'm in Mark 16, verse 8. Mark 16, and verse 8. This is the angel speaking. The angels, but Mark only records about one angel. But go tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. So the angels, remember what Luke's recorded, they tell them that Jesus is risen just as he promised he would when they were still in Galilee. And now they tell them, not only that, but they say he is going before you to Galilee. Tell the disciples and Peter, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. Now here's where the different ending comes in. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. All right, now keep that in mind. Mark says their immediate reaction is that they go out, they flee the tomb, trembling, 
they're astonished and they're afraid. And at that moment, just that moment, they say nothing to anyone. All right, now let's look at Luke's ending of this event. We're in Luke chapter 24 and verse 8. And they remembered his words, that is the words of the angel. And returning from the tomb, actually the angels, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Look at Matthew 28 and verse 8 now. Very similar. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. All right. So Mark tells us this is what they immediately did. Luke and Matthew say, well, this is also what they did. It isn't that they're, in, again, in conflict. This is just a description of what happens immediately after they leave the tomb and then what happens a little bit later. I think this is one of those great discussion places. I wish we could talk about this. Let me know what you think about these two different responses described of the women who left the empty tomb. Call me. Text me. 281-701-7847. I'm sure most of you have that memorized by now. <laughs> Email me if you'd like at rayford.welch at yahoo.com. Again, very easy to remember. I have to make these things easy, friends, so I can remember. So let me tell you what I think is going on here. Again, I think this is a situation where all three writers are correct. Of course they're correct. They're simply describing both responses made by the women to the angels at separate moments in time. Here's what I mean. I believe Mark is describing their initial reaction, the trembling and astonishment as they run out of the tomb, trembling, amazed, and afraid. Immediately after leaving the tomb, they're scared. They're, they just can't take it all in. But we might say today, at this moment, immediately leaving the tomb, they can't wrap their brains around it yet. But this clearly changes. How long did it take? Maybe it was just a few minutes. Maybe it was a little bit longer. Maybe it was several minutes. I can't really say. But Matthew and Luke described, I believe, what happened after the women had a little bit of time to take all of this in. Now, we do that, don't we? Something unbelievable, something completely out of the ordinary, something that we're not expecting happens, and for a few moments, we're just like, we don't know what to do. How are we going to react? What should we do? And I think that's what's going on here. But after there's a little bit of time to calm down, <laughs> I need that time, I can tell you, and, and reflect a little bit, then we're kind of ready to make a, a better decision, I think, um, or at least a different decision. And so I think that's what's going on here. Matthew and Luke are describing what happened after they had a little bit of time to think about all this. Then they go to the apostles to tell them, the disciples and apostles, to tell them what they have seen and heard. That is the angel, what the angel has told them, what the women saw, what the women heard that Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, again, notice they have a different message than Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene gets back to where the apostles are before these women. She would have had to have. She comes with one message. The body's gone. We don't know where it's at. They come with a different message. He is risen from the dead and he's going before you to Galilee. But the apostles are not going to believe either one, not either Mary Magdalene or the other women at this point. They just can't grasp that there's actually a resurrection and that it has already taken place. Well, we're going to come back to these women and how in time they will make their declaration of Jesus' resurrection, again, which won't be believed by the apostles. But before we get there, we need to go back to Mary Magdalene, who remembered, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I think it's just very important for this lesson. Remember, Mary Magdalene did not hear the angel outside the tomb. She did not go into the tomb. She did not see that the tomb was empty. 
or rather she knows the tomb is empty, but she doesn't know why. And she believes, remember, she believes that someone has taken the body and moved it. So she now has run quickly. The other women are still at the tomb, seeing everything there. She's run quickly to tell the apostles and Peter and John, especially that the body is gone. So we've got to go back to John's gospel now. Because he is the only one, not surprisingly, who gives us this account. Now we read verses 1 and 2 a moment ago, but I want to read it again to get the context. So I'm in John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, we believe it's John, this is John's gospel, the one who Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Now, I gave emphasis there, but I think she's a little bit frantic, don't you? She thinks someone has stolen the body. When she goes back after the apostles go and leave and she goes back to the tomb, she still thinks that. That's for another lesson next week. But right now it's important to us real, to realize that she does not have any clue that there's been a resurrection. Now, you know, I always want to make full disclosure uh, in our studies. I think it's important here. So I need to let you know that back in Luke 24, verses 8 through 10, I'm going to ask you to turn back there with me, okay? Back in Luke 24, 8 through 10, we'll read that in a moment. Luke describes that the women who had entered the tomb also arrived back eventually at where the apostles are, where Mary Magdalene is at that moment telling them that the body is gone. She, she doesn't know why. She doesn't know where it is. They're also going to come there. And apparently the other women who have seen the angel will supply the information that Jesus has risen, according to what Luke says. Now, Mary Magdalene tells them what she knows, that the body is gone, but not she still doesn't know that the, uh, the resurrection is taking place. And she will not know after this happens. Um, is she just not listening to the women? Is she just still so frantic? Maybe she stepped away. Maybe she, I, we don't know. But notice what Luke describes here. And they remembered, that is the women who saw the empty tomb and heard the angel. They remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So based on what the other Gospels say, Mary Magdalene must not at this point have told them that the resurrection has happened, but she has told them what she knows that the body is missing. The other women supply more information to the apostles. Apparently Mary doesn't hear it, or Mary just cannot, she can't grasp it. Because again, we're going to see that she still doesn't know when she gets back to the tomb the second time. We'll see that next week. So Mary has told the apostles the body is missing. She doesn't know where it's taken. The other women, as I said a moment ago, tell them, in fact, they've seen the angels. They've been told that Jesus is risen and he will go before the apostles, disciples to Galilee. And the apostles do not believe any of the, these ladies. They don't believe Mary. They don't believe the other women. Well, as we move further next week into the resurrection narrative, it will be clear that Mary Magdalene still doesn't grasp what the other women do since she didn't see the, the angel and didn't go in the tomb. But she's going to be given the incredible blessing of being the first person to actually see the resurrected Christ. Next week also, we're going to see what happens when Peter and John, not believing the women, when they come and tell, tell them that, the body's gone and the angel said he's risen. They don't believe it. They run to the tomb. And again, how that after they leave the tomb, Mary Magdalene will come back and Jesus will reveal himself, show himself to her uh, there in the garden. Well, friends, I hope that you have a blessed week, the rest of the week ahead of you. 
Before we close, would you bow with me in another word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you, dear God, for all of your blessings. We thank you, dear Father, for the time that we have to get together in the middle of the week and slow down and study from your word. I pray, Father, that the things that I've shared are clear and concise, have been clear and concise, and, and that it's been helpful, that it has been uplifting, that it has been challenging and encouraging, Father. Dear God, be with us every step that we take. In Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. May God bless you all.